Everyone. I'm Jeff Rubin. I'm the president of the Pinole Historical Society, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for this special program given by a very special man. So today I found out that in addition to his 40 plus years as a teacher and as a historical scholar and researcher and as an author, he was a championship basketball coach. Who would have thought? <laughs> Who would have thought? Anyway, if there's anybody in this city whose history goes back as far as George's, um, I'd like to meet that person. Uh, no, George was not around when the city was formed in 1903, but his mother was. And his mother was a teacher for how many years? Oh, 35 plus. 35 years. And George followed in her footsteps. She wanted me to be a carpenter. I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> yes, no religion at these meetings. Anybody got that? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, getting back to the introduction. Uh, and George's family even goes back farther than that. So no one knows more about the history of this area and in specifically the history of this city than George Vincent, and he put together this special program, Candles of History, celebrating 200 years of the heydays and remnants of the Rancho El Pinal uh, in commemoration of the bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of the El Pinal Grant in 1823 that ultimately created the city of Pinal. Welcome, George. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, or after I'm through, maybe don't want to remember me, um, <laughs> I just want to mention, uh, I went to Danza High School. I went to the old Pinole School on the Hill. And uh, graduated from there, from the kindergarten through eighth grade. School's gone now, but I come from a time period before uh, pajamas were a fashion statement. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I'm going to try to entertain you tonight with uh, more of a history of the people that lived at El Rancho Pinola than just the story of how it came to be and how the ranchos interact with each other and so forth, which I will do also. But uh, I taught California history at Contra Costa College for 10 plus years. Um, I also, my thesis, my master's thesis was on the four generations of the Martinez family. And the reason that I wrote about the family was my mother grew up in Pinole Valley. As you go out to the Y where that ranch is still, she grew up there um, in 1898. She was born there, uh, one of seven children. And uh, they lost the ranch in uh, 2000, uh, pardon me, 1910 because my grandfather did not pay the taxes on the property and it was sold at the county courthouse. So the Mormon, pardon me, the Mooring family at that time bought it. But um, my mother, as a young girl, grew up next to another little girl named Ramona Martinez, the fourth generation of the Martinez family who lived in the old adobes that were built in 1936 that the Martinez family moved into from San Jose in 1930, pardon me, 1837. So they became good friends and they grew up together. Uh, Ramona was very poor. Her family was very poor at that time. Um, she and my mother went to the school in the old hill, uh, the old school on the hill in Pinole. And they had a pony cart that they rode each day uh, with a white horse. They tied him at the foot of the school and went home after school. But uh, they grew up as adults also. And when Ramona died in 1918, uh, sadly, uh, from cancer, her uh, mother, I gave my mother her album and pictures and letters that she had written and the poems that Ramona had written because Ramona was quite a poetry writer. She grew up writing poetry because her life was very difficult and her poems reflect the difficulty of her life and her love for her mother. Her parents' constant separation, uh, she loved them both, but 
Um, she had to go with her mother when her father and mother uh, divorced. So anyway, my mother was her friend. And so that's how I got started in thinking about the Martinez family. So I'd like to show you this. If you get a chance to uh, look at it. This is uh, from the Fiesta del Pinol. Now some of you might be old enough to remember the Fiesta <laughs> del Pinol. It started in the 60s. This particular poster uh, was from, uh, from uh, the Bicentennial in 1975-1976. And this was uh, one of the last times that the Fiesta Pinol was celebrated. And I wanted to bring this to show you the difference between now and then in Pinol. It says here, in 1838, the uh, celebration lasted about a week. Dancing was kept up all night. Picnics were held in the forum with the afternoon devoted to bullfights. In 1976, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday includes a carnival, dance, barbecue, parade. Pre-fiesta events include a fashion show, Miss Panola pageant, art guild exhibit, times and places will be recorded in local papers. And from August 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. So look where we are today compared to back then. This was a time when Panolians were really interested in their history, <coughs> especially the local government and the local businesses, which everyone took part. Uh, it's too bad and sad that we just don't have that same <coughs> enthusiasm for history that we once did. But anyway, um, memories are good to have, even if we don't have you know, them going on at the moment. So if you have a chance, if you'd like to look at that, that's one of the artifacts we have in our society. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk today about uh, the Martinez family, I'm going to try to tell a little bit about each one of them as individuals uh, to show you what happened to them, which is a reflection really of what happened to most of the Rancho families in this area in Northern and Southern California. In some cases, it was the uh, loss of their land was sporadic. In some cases, it accelerated very quickly, like in the Martinez family. Uh, but once the land was gone, the family social order was upset as well. So, in 1836, letter envelopes were not the vogue in California. If people wanted to communicate with one another, they used sealing wax. Red sealing wax on their letters was a sign of the common, ordinary matters of life. Black sealing wax on the letters was a sign of the death of a friend or relative. And green seating wax on the letters meant that it was um, someone asking for a loan or a favor. Uh, due to that custom, you knew right away when you got the letter whether it was good or bad news. Now, the reason I mention that is, as I go through the situations and the life dynamics of the Martinez family, you can see how the death of a friend or relative happens, loans, favors, and losses happen, and uh, also the common, ordinary matters of life that take place. So let me tell you uh, first a little bit about the Rancho period in California, uh, a bygone era. It lasted from about 1822 to 1850. Now, the new generation of people growing up in California, Hispanics, uh, the Mexican-Americans, were called Californios. Now, they were people who grew up in Alta or Upper California. And they had a new institution that grew up, a new social order. It was called a rancho. And people in those times uh, had a landed culture. By that time, many of you are familiar with the missions of California, um, the 21 missions. Um, I made a pilgrimage once to, uh, to go to all the 21 missions because I heard that uh, the mayor of San Francisco's wife, uh, Elioto, I think it was, I think she had gone to all the 21 missions, so I said, she can do it, I can do it. <laughs> um, but anyway, the missions had been secularized. In 1821, Mexico got its independence from Spain. And everything changed at that time. And this was in 1821. So by 1822, the uh, ranchos began to develop all over California. And these were land grants that were given to uh, certain individuals that pleased the Mexican government. Uh, and the awesome Martinez was one of those people. He had been on the uh, frontier of uh, Northern California 
uh, Alta, California, was his call, uh, for 20 years as a lieutenant in the um, Spanish army. But when uh, independence came, he uh, readily joined the uh, Mexican army. And I might say that uh, this new social order was characterized by uh, a new group of people or gentry, social elites, you might call them, uh, called dons, who, and which means lord, and doña, which means uh, the, the female or the wife of the, the ranchero. And these rancheros uh, owned very, very large, were granted large, large amounts of land to, to live in. Um, now, as you can see here, this is uh, some of the ranchos of uh, Contra Costa. Um, you had the Mart uh, Martinez Rancho, Rancho Panol. Um, you also had uh, the Moraga Rancho in uh, Oakland. You had the Rancho San Antonio, uh, a big one, a uh, large one there. You had uh, in San Rancho San Pablo by the Castros. And uh, in uh, San Ramon, Rancho San Ramon, with the Amador family and so forth. So this is what the ranchos looked like, probably around 18, in around the 1850s or 1840s before everything changed. Jeff, do you have the other one? The next. This is uh, the El Canole Grant. This is what it looked like in 1870. And if you look at the land ownership uh, things here, you see uh, very, very seldom do you find a Spanish surname. By that time, in 1870, most of the properties had been sold. This is, as you can see, the Oak and Old Grant. Most of the properties had been sold to uh, foreigners or um, mostly uh, Americans, because by that time, uh, it had become very, very Americanized by that time. I want to read to you. Um, From this book, this little book. <clears throat> what was rancho like, life like in California? Now, this particular man named Horace Allen, uh, he uh, was in Northern California. He knew the Martinez family. And he went to one of their celebrations. And I might mention that uh, He tell, you know, a great deal of uh, history of the Rancho period has been gotten from this particular individual. Anyway, he said, the first time I had the pleasure of witnessing a bullfight was in the month of October, in the year of our Lord, 1852. It was on the hilarious occasion of a wedding at the residence of Don Vicente Martinez in Old Pinole. Let me say once and for all that no one should be offended if I am kindly and respectfully personal. In order to illustrate these pleasant reminiscences of the olden time, I say that Mary Wedding and that bullfight were at the residence of Don Vicente Martinez, and the caballeros who took part in the fight were Don uh, William M. Smith, Don Pedro Higuera, and Don Samuel J. Tennant. By that time, Tennant, Samuel Tennant, had married into the Martinez family, and he married uh, Rafael and Martinez. And so, uh, these were all Gay young gentlemen then, everybody was there. Everybody from the country 50 miles around was there. And everybody danced and dined and whined to his heart's content. I've said the Spanish ranchero was extravagant in his mode of living. Well, why not? He could well afford to be extravagant, for he was rich, very rich. There were those dozens of solid silver candlesticks. There were those solid silver salvers, three feet long. There were those quaint little Mexican table sets of solid silver. The ladies of the household were provided with sumptuous and most costly apparel. He had gold in abundance, the proceeds from the ready sale of his thousands of beef cattle. And what could he do with all this gold? He said, let us have sport with it. So he and his neighboring rancheros had the regular gambling set to every Sunday evening after church. So they waited until after church to have their little fun. But anyway, um, this shows you uh, what life was like during this rancho period for these early peoples. <clears throat> uh, just glance at my notes for a second here. The, uh, the rancho was uh, characterized by a confined household of many, many children um, who had the 
complete devotion to the authority of the father. The father was a patriarch and the father ruled and his uh, discipline was unquestioned in the family. Um, and the mother could be that way too, not just the father. Uh, to give you some examples of uh, the patriarchal authorities that existed, in the De La Guerra family of Santa Barbara, every evening they had uh, evening prayers as a family as well as morning prayers. The children, before they went to bed at night, had to kneel and kiss their father's hand. Um, when they were grown, they still had to show respect. They could not uh, sit without his uh, permission. They could not smoke without his permission. They could not put on their hat without his permission. In the uh, Amador family of Rancho San Ramon, not too far from us here in San Ramon, um, Jose Amador would lock his children in at night and then unlock them out in the morning. Now I think the reason for that was not just because uh, he was so strict, they were afraid of being kidnapped by Indians. Because by that time, the ranchos were under siege by the Indians of California, who now were on the offensive, who murdered families, kidnapped the children, uh, stole the livestock, etc., etc. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But one of their favorite tactics was uh, the Indians, when they attacked a rancho to steal livestock, they knew that the rancheros always had a cow with a bell on it that rang. So when they heard that ring, they knew that everything was okay in the barn. Well, the Indians are very smart. <laughs> what they would do was, one Indian would ring a bell, the other Indian had a horsehair saw, which would quietly saw through the adobe blocks so they could get to the horses and cattle and steal them. So they had to it was a very difficult time for the rancheros at that time. Um, how did women fare in uh, rancho society? Well, it depends how you looked at it. Um, um, Briones, a name that you're familiar with from here, uh, one of the Briones descendants says, the task of women in rancho society was music, dancing, religion, and amiability. <laughs> but when the American Captain Wilkinson uh, his ship docked in San Francisco Bay, or in San Pablo Bay, he had a different take on it, he, the Yankee sailor did. He said the women were slaves, and, uh, the, women were cruel, the men were cruel to their wives who made, and made, who were slaves to their husbands. And um, so you have a little bit uh, difference of opinion there. Uh, let me read you a little bit about what this gentleman had to say about the ladies, the men. The young men of each household, although sometimes reckless and wild like other boys, were polite, sprightly, and handsome. The young women were beautiful and graceful and manners most charming. We shall never forget those social fandang fandangos at the time, the dancing. <clears throat> so, he enjoyed watching the bullfight, and I think he enjoyed watching the uh, senoritas uh, dance as well that time. But anyway, the inheritance of land gave the, the uh, heirs of the rancheros a birthright and something to pass on to them and make the perpetuity of the family as well. So the family lasts as well. So you can see how land and family are interdependent upon each other. And every family, every rancho family had a large family. Now the Martinez's had 11 children, nine girls, and two sons. And uh, most of them were a large, confined household. Uh, the Martinez's went to a mass every morning. Um, every night they said their prayers before going to bed with the family. There was an interdependency between the children, parents, and relatives, but all under the capstone of father's authority. And Ignacio Martinez was a then a not a very pleasant person in many, many respects. He was not liked by a lot of people in California. Um, later on, Bancroft, the historian, has said, well, he was very hospitable and courteous, so as a ranchero. But as a lieutenant in the military, he was not. Um, so uh, just to get back to that point, let me quickly uh, back here. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try quickly to go through the four generations 
starting with the first one who, who set the direction for uh, El Rancho Pinal, and that was Ignacio Martinez. Ignacio Martinez was born in uh, 1774 in Mexico. He was born to Spanish parents, very important in the social structure of colonial Spain at that time, because the peninsulare, or the native Spaniard, was above him in social standing. And Ignacio Martinez, the one thing he wanted in life, it was recognition and social standing. So he always tried to pretend he was a nobleman, and he was in one sense. Um, society at that time was ruled by a custom called primogenitor. Now primogenitor meant that whoever the first son in the family was, that was the one that got everything. If you were another son or sons, you had two choices, the military or the priesthood. So <laughs> Ignacio Martinez was very, very fond of his first and oldest son who was named Jose. We'll see his picture in a little bit. Um, this is um, Maria Martina Arares de Martinez. Um, she married, uh, in 1802, she married uh, Ignacio Martinez in Mexico. And she was a matron of discipline as well. Um, General Vallejo, by the way, was the main Mexican general in California, Northern California, during the uh, Mexican War. And he lived in Sonoma, if you've ever been to the Petaluma Adobe and visited his home. That's where he was kept captive by the Bear, Bear Flag Revolters in 1846 when the revolution in California happened and the Americans began to take over California. But he was afraid of his mother until she died. <laughs> Deathly afraid of his mother. And this lady was very conscious of her social class and her husband's social class as well. Um, the children married into approved marriages to the ranchos next to them. Now you can imagine if he has nine girls, he's going to have a, there are a lot of suitors coming to that rancho in Panol. Okay, but this lady, uh, the second son, I'm going to talk about Vicente Martinez. He was the younger son. And he was the least favored son uh, in the family, <clears throat> and his father favored Jose because he gave Jose control of the rancho, the rodeos, just about everything. And Jose was the first one to come to Pinole. He came here in the 18, 1828, and he began building the adobe little by little by little. You have to understand that the rancheros at this time in the 1830s were fearful to go into Pinole, fearful to go anywhere because by that time the Indian menace was terrific. Um, the Indians were on the offensive. They were no longer docile missionary Indians that uh, you sometimes hear about. They uh, kidnapped children, they burned the rancho, ranchos, um, <clears throat> they stole the livestock, and uh, they killed the inhabitants. Um, Ignacio Martinez, her, her husband, um, he was cited many times for fighting Indians, especially uh, from uh, Mount Diablo. Uh, the <clears throat> he would take forays into Mount Diablo with the soldiers to fight the Indians who had uh, raided the uh, local uh, rancheros. It was pretty, the times were pretty bad uh, for the rancheros. Uh, Ignacio Martinez in Rancho Pinole had a brass canyon, pardon me, a brass cannon mounted in front of his home for protection. Um, but um, this young man, this was the oldest one, Jose Martinez. Um, I'll tell you just a little bit about him. He really first established the rancho. He was uh, sent out here in 1828 uh, uh, by his father to begin developing and took 300 cattle from San Mateo. And that's how Martinez began his rancho. But you didn't come out into Pinole and stay here because the Indians would kill you. It was a, Pinole was a very dangerous place that was described as a wild and remote valley with herds of uh, wild elk, uh, wild uh, cattle, and lots and lots of grizzly bear. So it was a very dangerous place to come out to. So, you can understand that Ignacio Martinez and his wife Martina would not leave the home when they were in in San Jose to just come out here to Pinole. They, the only time that the um, people came out here were the mayor or do, mayor or domos, they called them, or a foreman that came out to work at the rancho once a year to uh, round, up, round up and uh, brand those spotted cattle. They always had spotted cattle for some reason. It just ran wild all over the hills, everywhere. Okay. And um, 
other than that, they try to stay in the cities or towns. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, <clears throat> Ignacio Martinez, um, in, from 18, he readily adapted to the New Mexican government. Uh, there was more room for advancement for him there. He never got beyond lieutenant as a rank, but uh, he did uh, see that as an opportunity. They appointed him as Comandante of the San Francisco Presidio. And he was there from 1821 to about 1831. Now, what happened at that time? Well, in 1831, uh, Ignacio Martinez retired to the Pueblo of San Jose. Now, San Jose uh, was a town that was being constantly raided by Indian bands. Um, at that time, the, they called uh, General Vallejo, that was called out to lead an expedition to counter the Indian attacks. Um, the uh, grain storehouse uh, was raided at uh, San Mateo. I mean, there were all kinds of depredations going on by the Indians. So everyone was afraid, really, up and down the coast. Can you guess why that changed? Why the Indians suddenly uh, decided uh, to pull back? Anyone? More arms, more cannons. I'm, I've been wondering how the Native Americans actually fought. What did they have? It's, I heard cannons by the uh, Spanish. What did the others have? They had bows and arrows, spears. So it was sheer number that made the others, the non-natives? Up and down California. All up and down from northern to southern California, the Indians are on the offense of pushing the ranchos and the rancheros out of their homes and out of the cities. The Pueblo of San Jose was raided many times. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons that Martinez moved his family to Pinole Valley, because I think he was afraid that, you know, of all the Indian raids on in, uh, San Jose. The coming of the Americans, because they hated the Indians also. They annihilated. When the Americans came during the what? During the gold, gold rush. Gold rush, exactly. That's when they began to annihilate the Native Americans also, because they were in their way. Heck, up until the beginning of the 20th century, even into the 20th century, there were bounties for uh, California Indian bodies being killed. I mean, northern, especially in Northern California. You've heard the story of Ishi, the last uh, Yahi Indian. Well, that, at that time, that's what was happening. But anyway, uh, just to give you an idea, there was a lot of fear because of uh, the Indian depredations. They would kidnap uh, children, uh, they would uh, burn uh, homes, they would steal livestock, you know, that, and they were doing very well until 1848. That changed everything. By the way, does anyone remember who discovered gold in California? John Marshall. John Marshall. No, Jim, you know, Jim. Uh, the Marshall and uh, Wimmer. Wimmer and Marshall. Yeah, James Marshall. But he was not the first one. That was in 18... Uh, 49 or 1848. In 1842 in Southern California, Francisco Lopez, a Mexican American, was the first to discover gold in California. And while he was out rounding up horses. And uh, so that was a gold pocket that uh, until the Mexican War ended, it lasted. Speaking of the Mexican War, it's, now it's called the Mexican American War, by the way. When I grew up, it was called the Mexican War. Um, the United States wanted to expand from, north, from the Pacific, Atlantic to Pacific Ocean. Um, San Francisco Bay was a wonderful port that they wanted. And I might mention that the Martinez family, the Castro families, and other Rancho families in this area would go to Point Pinole. Have you ever been there? Point Pinole? Yes. Okay, that was a deep water port. That's where the Yankee trading ships would come in and anchor. And the rancheros uh, would... Uh, <coughs> take their hides and the tallow from the cattle that they butchered in Rodeo, the place today called Rodeo, the town. That was the place of the rodeo where they rounded them up and killed them. And that's where the grizzlies came out of the, <coughs> out of the hills to feed on the carcasses. I think I wrote something about that in the book. But uh, anyway, the Spanish had carretas, these large wooden uh, carts pulled by oxen with large wooden wheels. And they would take the hides and tallows to Point Pinole. The Yankee trading ships were docked there because they couldn't get anything here in California from Mexico. Very, very rare. 
In the Spanish time, it was against the law to trade with the Yankees. Uh, during the Mexican period, there was a lot of trading, some legal, some illegal. But um, the, the Martinez's and the Castro's would uh, trade with the Yankee traders. Here they would bring their hide and tallow, hides made into shoes in Boston, tallow used for their lamps. And they would get goods they couldn't get. For example, um, the uh, young ladies, the senoritas in California, um, they had to use toothbrushes made of willow bar, willow branches. Okay, so they were able to get real toothbrushes from the Yankee traders as well as metal things and things like that that you couldn't get. Ignacio Martinez, his father, uh, spent 11 years on the frontier not paid at all. So he was, uh, became the Comandante of uh, <clears throat> San Francisco Presidio. Then in, in the late 1830s <coughs> and early 1840s, he was the Alcalde of San Francisco, which means the mayor of San Francisco. Now he had a big <coughs> redwood boat that he kept out at the foot of uh, Fernandez's uh, wharf down here. Uh, <laughs> And uh, because of a bad political decision he made, some of his enemies, and he made a lot of enemies, um, burned the boat. That's the boat he used to take to uh, do his duties in San Francisco. <clears throat> but anyway, um, <clears throat> to talk a little bit about uh, this young man. Uh, this is uh, Don Jose Martinez. He was the oldest son. And <clears throat> he was the one that developed El Rancho Panola. He came out and his father gave him authority over the whole rancho. And he, um, I was trying to think of the exact date. Um, he was uh, in 1837, I think it was, yes. Uh, 1837, that's when the Martinez family moved out to Rancho El Pano. I, I, I should backtrack a little bit. <coughs> Getting my thoughts kind of confused. I need more, uh, as I said, that more <coughs> prevagen porridge. Um, but uh, Jose was the father's favorite, no doubt about it. And the second son, Vicente, was less glamorous. Um, Jose didn't lose his property as fast as his brother did. Jose was, uh, again, uh, had the biggest funeral ever seen in Martinez. And he was loved by so many of the rancheros and so many of the Americans. He Americanized very easily compared to other uh, rancheros. In other words, uh, you know, became more involved in American ways and customs and so forth that some of the others resisted. Now, Jose uh, met an unfortunate end. Um, he was uh, married at age 23. Uh, he was married in 1838, excuse me, 1838. And he had the first son. So Ignacio Martinez was very, very happy. When he was married in 1837, that's what that poster was talking about. They had the biggest wedding the father had ever thrown. For, for, for the youngest son was married first, but he didn't have as big a wedding celebration as this. He was married in uh, <clears throat> Mission San Jose. And when he came back, there was a whole week of celebrations, bullfights. Uh, feasting, uh, dancing. Uh, Ignacio Martinez, uh, the father, even built upon an extra addition to the Martinez adobe to hold all of the people that came there for the whole week of festivities. And, um, but he had an unfortunate uh, accident. He was roping a steer in 1864, and the lariat caught in his hand and had a horrible gash in his hand, and he got blood poisoning. And from that, he got lockjaw. And he died in a hospital in San Francisco in 1864. So that was uh, most unfortunate because by that time, he had a rancho out in the Pinole Valley further out toward Martinez. And uh, he had a large family there. He had about 16 people living in his household. Uh, the Martinez's had about 13, including Indian servants. Um, he even hired a teacher from uh, Spain to come and teach his uh, children. Uh, so he, he was quite an important individual. But the, uh, the one I want to talk about a little bit more is uh, Vicente. Can, can, uh, the reason I don't have a picture here of Don Ignacio Martinez is there is none. Okay? There was a portrait 
in the uh, museum in San Francisco, but according to Martinez legends, according to their folklore, um, it was destroyed during the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. So we don't have any picture of him at all. Um, just assume he either looked like this fellow or the other one you just saw. <laughs> a little, little bit like that. But this is Don Vicente Martinez. This is the second son. Uh, less glamorous than his uh, older brother. He was always in the shadow of his older brother. And he always tried to do something different to get some recognition for himself. Now, Don Ignacio Martinez, when he was married, now he was married in 1837. He was 19 years old at the time when he was married. He married Gabriel Moraga, again, an arranged marriage from the Moraga family. They had two children, Francisca and Merced, but she died, the mother died in childbirth in 1839. So he was left with two uh, orphan children. I might mention by this time, Don Ignacio Martinez had built an adobe home for each of his sons. He built one for uh, Don Jose and one for Don Vicente and their families. So you had the main Martinez casa or adobe home and then on either side, you had the high of the sons. And this became known as Panol Viejo, Old Panol. Okay, the adobes of Old Panol. And those homes became very important. Now I might mention, we'll see some of those later in the slide of the uh, excavation of, that was done in 1976. But um, adobe homes, uh, it is said that the Martinez home in Panol Valley, and I might mention again, that they came out there and occupied the adobe in 1837. It takes about a year to build an adobe home, so they started working on it in 1835, 36, and then by 1837, it was safe enough to move their family from the Pueblo of San Jose to the new home in Pinot Valley. Um, but it was a dangerous place to be. I just want to emphasize that, uh, very dangerous. So um, Ignacio Martinez was quite an Indian fighter. Uh, he was wounded a number of times. Uh, he led many expeditions to fight the renegade uh, Indians for the Spanish government and the Mexican government, especially around Mount Diablo. They used to hide in Mount Diablo and come down and raid their uh, nearby ranchos, and then also in Southern California. But um, <clears throat> Don Vicente had uh, two children, and uh, from his marriage to Gabriel Moraga, and then you had Jose Martinez, and he had one son. He married uh, Antonio Peralta. The Peralta Rancho was what we today call uh, Oakland, Rancho San Antonio in Oakland. So again, the, you can see these intermarriages that you had with the ne nearby rancheros, uh, marrying families, uh, girls marrying gentlemen, and so forth and so on. So you had all this interrelationships going on. When Don Ignacio Martinez died, he died in June of 1848. He was ill for almost the whole year of 1847. Uh, when he died, he had a funeral procession that was gigantic. It took five days for two black oxen pulling the carreta with his body to get to San Jose where he was buried under the floorboards of Mission San Jose Church. So, it was a, a huge procession. You can imagine just all these Californios going there to pay their respects to him at that time. Um, what about his will? Well, Don Ignacio dictated his will before he died to a man named Berriessa, one of the Berriessas that had married into the Martinez family. And the will was all about nothing about land. It was just cattle, horses, and other livestock. Who should get what? Well, Mr. Berriessa burned the will. Why? He burned the will because um, Jose, the one you saw before, the oldest son, supposedly, just before your fathers died, tried to get his dad to sign over one-fifth of all the cattle and horses to him instead of sharing them with the other the ten children in the family. Um, he said that there, he burned it because you needed seven witnesses by Mexican law, and there were only two. But I think it was the former reason that he burned it. So anyway, there was no will for that. Uh, in 1850, the Martinez clan, the 11 children, got together and divided up the rancho. Each child got 1,500 acres. Okay? 
Um, I might mention that the rancho was Ignacio Martinez when he uh, <clears throat> first applied for the grant for the rancho in 1823. It was for 35 leagues of land or about 18,000 acres of land, okay, in a place called El Pino. Now he called it El Pino uh, for legal purposes. What happened was it was a provisional grant, which means that uh, it was, he didn't have clear title to it yet. And the papers, somehow the papers were lost, the provisional papers were lost. So it wasn't until 1842 when a governor you're familiar with, Juan Batista Alvarado, um, issued him the final grant to Rancho El Pinol for uh, 45 square leagues of land. And it stretched from San Pablo Bay to the Carquina Straits, 18,000 acres. Um, I might mention when the old Don died, he left behind land, livestock, and wealth. Okay? Now, when his grandson died, who was named after him, Ignacio de Connor, and Martinez, when he died in 1928, his legacy was that of a few barber tools that they sold to pay for his funeral expenses. So you see between that time period, between 1823 and 1928, something happened to the family. And the loss of land and the loss of rancho culture disappeared in 1848 with the coming of Americans and uh, their land title litigation. Um, Don Vicente was an interesting character. Um, he, uh, his, he was the one that legend has it that his mother horsewhipped. She was a matron of discipline after the old Don died. Everybody was subservient to her. They did what she said. She lived in the old adobe with her um, a daughter, Concepcion, who was uh, <clears throat> had, had mental problems. She had brain damage when she was born. So the mother had to take care of her like a, as a child, really. But uh, and Don Vicente had his own adobe, but he wanted to be independent. So he did two things. Number one, he was the first one to get married before his older son. His son got married, his brother got married at 23. He got married at 19. He married a Peralta. That's why the father gave him such a big celebration, wedding celebration. Fired the cannon when he came back with his bride from San Jose and so forth. Uh, Don Vicente, though, also had another coup that he did. And this coup was, <clears throat> pardon me, that um, he was the first one to leave the family of uh, adobes of Pinole Valley. Okay? Now, I might mention the adobe because I started to talk about it and then I got digressed. The adobe building that he built had built was 42 feet long by about 18 feet wide. Okay? It was built of adobe bricks. Now, to un understand the uh, construction of this time, you're going to need materials and you're going to need men to work. Well, where do you get the people? Well, the Spanish rancheros still enslaved the Indians. The Berryessas in Napa would have bands of Indians. The Indians lived in little groups called rancherias. And the Spanish rancheros, as the Americans did, they would uh, abduct them and use them as slaves for work gangs and bring them to the ranchos to work in their little bands there until the work was done. Um, where did they get the adobe bricks? Well, they made them there. And uh, adobe bricks, it took about 2,500 bricks to make a two-room adobe house. So where did they get the roof? Uh, well, they used redwood shingles and redwood beams, and they got those from uh, Oakland Hills, the redwood trees the Oakland Hills. You'll see in the slide later on, I better check this, see what time is. Slide later on, the uh, outline of uh, the uh, Adobe's uh, foundation, <coughs> limestone blocks. And the limestone blocks came from Napa or came from um, the Mount Diablo area also. So all those things had to be brought in. Uh, the Adobe walls, were made of adobe bricks that uh, blocks that were about 30 feet, uh, pardon me, 30 inches by 24 inches. They were pretty big. So adobe brick makers in those days made about six dollars a day, and carpenters made about ten dollars a day, you know, working at that time. So anyway, the Martinez Adobe was built by 1837 for the family to move into and occupy. Now Don Vicente 
moved out of the family. There must have been some kind of discord, and I know what the discord was, because in 1848, this young man, his wife had passed away. He met another woman. Her name was Navis Soto, and she was not of his class. This is uh, Navis Soto de Martinez. They were married in Mission Dolores in San Francisco in 1848. Now, 1848 is when his father died. He married her just before the father died. That's why the mother took the horse whip to him, because she did not approve of this marriage. This was below their class standing. So he moved to his <coughs> new adobe that he built in the Canada del Hombre in Martinez. He had the first, or Vincente had the first adobe in Martinez. It was a two-story adobe, three rooms upstairs, two rooms downstairs. Um, it was a, he was near the John Muir home. If you go to the John Muir home today, the adobe is still standing there. It was saved in, here it is. It was saved in 1950 by Louis Stein, the Contra Costa historian. And it was a huge adobe for the time. It cost an awful lot and uh, it took about a year to make. Well, <clears throat> What happened to it? Well, he moved his new family and his new wife and children into this adobe. And by 1853, by 1853, he had lost this adobe to back taxes, to mortgages, to uh, debts he had to pay, and so forth. He did not adapt at all to the new Yankee way of uh, doing the business and litigation. Unfortunately, um, the land, <laughs> the coming of the Americans met the into California and into Contra Costa County, the lands were very, uh, well, they wanted the lands very badly. So you had land speculators uh, taking advantage of people like him. He had only a mind for hide and tallow economics in a time when <clears throat> uh, Yankee Land Enterprise uh, took over. He could not read English, he could not speak English, he didn't understand the uh, Yankee ways. Uh, just to give you a couple examples, uh, the worst, two of the worst land grabbers in California, early California, American land, land grabbers, one was Horace Carpenter, Carpentier, and uh, he was the one who got Rancho San Antonio, which is today Oakland, he managed to use legal maneuvers to, uh, the Peraltas were in debt for taxes, back taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing you have to understand is that uh, in 1852 in California, the Americans had by that time taken over much of California. I, I might mention that uh, California was overrun by squatters. Americans. Americans came in, they felt, hey, we, we beat Amer Mexico in the war, California belongs to us, the land should belong to us. So every place uh, a day's ride from California was beset by squatters, and they used intimidation, force, and so forth, uh, anything they could to stay on the land. So many of the rancheros, you know, just, uh, they, they could not sell their land because the Americans set up a land commission in San Francisco in 1852, Land Title Commission. And the rancheros had to prove title to their land. And until they proved title, they were only classified as claimants, not owners. They could not sell their property. Now, the Martinez family, in June of 1852, applied to the Land Commission for the title to a place called Pinole. By the time it was done, in 1868, it had been 16 years in litigation. So you can imagine what they have left. They've had to pay taxes, Yankee lawyers, they've had to pay uh, all kinds of debts and so forth. Most of these rancheros lost their land because uh, they had to sell it off what was left of it because uh, they'd gone into uh, debt. Carpenter, Horace Carpenter, the scoundrel he was, <laughs> he got land from um, the Antonio, Rancho Peralta, uh, from the Peralta family, Rancho San Antonio, which is today Oakland. And he, <coughs> he swindled the Peraltas out of their land and then uh, sold interest in it for $60,000. Uh, 
Now, the way he was able to swindle them was they had gone into debt for taxes, lawyer fees, litigation, all of this, and then he picked up their debt and uh, picked up their land. But he also picked on someone a little closer, the Pacheco family, you know the Pacheco? If you go toward uh, Highway 4, Pacheco off ramp. Well, uh, Rafaelo Soto de Pacheco, an elderly widow that lived there, she couldn't read or write English. She could only make X her mark. And he talked her into signing over her interest in land to him, which he sold for $90,000. So there was a lot of that going on in, early, in that in that time period. But uh, anyway, Vicente Martinez loses this in 1853 for $2,000. Now the reason he lost it was he was he was uh, heavily in debt um, to uh, land speculators. He was in debt to merchants. Um, he was spending money like just, you just couldn't believe. And I might mention to you that a lot of the money, like I read to you a little while ago, a lot of the money that came to these people was the sale of cattle. During the gold rush, uh, 400 um, cattle sold for $500 a head in Sacramento. Now, in 1846, 400,000 cattle were sold for $4 a piece. Jose Amador in Rancho San Ramon, San Ramon he sold his cattle to the Yankees for $150 a head. So they made quite a bit of money, you know, selling cattle, and so did he. But he lost it all. His brother Jose didn't, and he was accidentally killed. But Vicente lost his home. He has a big family. Um, and by the way, he also inherited money from a nephew who passed away in the 1870s. What does he do right away? He starts to gamble it away, drink it away, and so forth. Now, his wife, Nieve Soto, got tired of him losing all their property. They only had two lots left in Martinez. Um, in, 18, in 1874, he sold six entire blocks in Martinez and six lots for $250. So his wife, Nieve, she got tired of him you know, giving away their property and giving away their birthright of their children. So she, she, in 1874, applied for his guardianship, okay? Saying that he was mentally unfit and in, had intemperate habits. He was a heavy drinker, walking the streets and saloons of Martinez. Martinez was formed, by the way, in 1949, 1849 by one of the Martinez family members. And um, I might mention to you that uh, the Americans, how did they get along with the Californios? Well, they wanted a peaceful cohab co cohabitation with the Americans. But it always didn't happen that way. For example, in uh, 18, 1852, Pacheco uh, sons stole a pair of boots from the store of Martinez. And what happened to him? The Americans took him, tied him to a tree, stripped his shirt off, and gave him a hundred lashes across his bare back. But what happened? The Californios got together, about a hundred of them with guns and weapons, they were going to burn down the town of Martinez. And the Americans of Martinez ran to Venetia to get guns and weapons also. So there was a confrontation at that time. But the Californios were shown Yankee justice another time. Uh, an Indian named uh, Antonio Francisco, I believe. Antonio Francisco uh, was charged with murdering one of the Berryessa boys. Now, they said he murdered the Berryessa boy, but I think the Berryessa son was trying to get him, to kidnap him, to go make, as a slave for work. But anyway, the Americans took him, put him in a cart, made him stand on a barrel, and uh, hung him from an oak tree in Martinez. So you can see there was confrontation at that time. Um, the Americans did not like the uh, 
ranchero, the Spanish rancheros, still living in the Martinez area. There was a lady named uh, Rafaela uh, de Soto. She had built an adobe home in Martinez in 1850. In 1851, she was thrown out of her home with all of her furniture on the street. Okay, and forced to live by, by the bay in a tule house of poles and hides and, and so forth. But, um, so he lost his home. And so what do you do when you lose your home? Where do you go? Where do you think he went? He had to go somewhere. Mom, yeah. He went back to live with mom. <laughs> yeah. Let me get a drink of water. Yes. He went to live with his widowed mother. Now, he had five children at that time. There were 13 people living in the old uh, adobe of the old valley at that time. So <clears throat> he had a home. Remember, he had a home. His father built a home for him and his brother. He had a home also. He lost that home to mortgages. So he's lost two adobe homes now. <laughs> in, in 1861, his mother, can we see, show her picture again, Jeff? In 1861, his mother signs over the old Martinez adobe to him for $100 and 100 acres she sells from her maternal love. <coughs> Five years later, he mortgages the home. Okay? In 1867, the home is, uh, the old adobe is sold on the courthouse steps in Martinez for $80.14 to a Martinez grocer named Lorenzo Lutel. Gone. He's lost three adobe homes. This beautiful one, and so forth. By the way, um, the biggest adobe home in Martinez was one built by Variessas. It was 70 feet long by 40 feet wide. It cost $20,000. And the uh, Hispanics were evicted from that home also, and that became um, <clears throat> the new school in Martinez for the Americans at that time, in the 1860s. Now, Rafaela Martinez Tenet, she was supposedly the most beautiful of the Martinez daughters. Okay? When Samuel Tenet came to Pinole in 1848 on his way up to the gold fields, he stopped at the Martinez Rancho and never left. Okay? And he married her, and they eventually had uh, 10 children. She was born, by the way, in 1822 at the Presidio of San Francisco when her father was commandante there at that time. Now, uh, Rafaela uh, passed away in uh, 1868, okay, at the age of 45, uh, leaving behind 10 children and the tenant ranch, which comprised today all of downtown Pinole and where the bowling alley is and everything where the high school is and so forth. Okay. Now, her share, her 1,500, 1,500 acre share of the ranch of Pinole was um, <clears throat> All of downtown Pinole and the waterfront. That was her share. And so she got a very choice piece of land in uh, Contra Costa. Now, her mother was at her bedside when she died. And no one knows exactly what happened to uh, Doña Martina, but her daughter, her Concepcion, died in 1861. That's when she gave the adobe over to her son, Vicente, hoping that he would keep it. And so in 1861, uh, she disappears. But uh, I kind of traced things down. I was doing research. I found out she lived her last days in a home in San Jose, where she originally came from. So that's where she ended up. But she was at the bedside of her uh, dying daughter in 1868, according to family uh, tradition, family lore. Okay. Now, to take you to the third generation, let me just refresh my memory for a second. Make sure I haven't left me out. Yes.
Now, this is, this is the third generation. This is Ignacio Martinez as a young man. Now, he was born at the old family adobe in 1849. He was the son of Vicente Martinez and Nieve Soto, his new wife. <clears throat> so, he was born in 1849 and he grew up on the uh, rancho. He was a uh, vaquero, a cowboy. He uh, later on became, uh, he was a jack of all trades. He was a miner in the mines of Summersville and uh, Nortonsville and the um, Quicksilver or Mercury Mines in the Mount Diablo. He was a cowboy, a miner, became a barber. Um, he uh, sold empanadas or the, uh, his favorite dish was empanadas. They would make and roll the meat into a, um, kind of like a tortilla. And he sold them in the saloons of Panola for 50 cents each. You know, they helped support himself. But he was a jack of all trades. This was him as a young man. The only picture I've taken of him as uh, a very young fellow. And <clears throat> he left the rancho, guess why, in 18, uh, age 16 in 1866 when his dad lost it. There was no hope for him there. This is what happened to a lot of the uh, next generation of ranchero children. Um, they had to be absorbed into the new cities that had sprung up in the old rancho grounds. And so he went to uh, Oakland and became a horse car driver. That's <laughs> um, like a street car pulled by horses. And he went to San Francisco and did the same. Um, as I said, he drove a six horse stagecoach from Mount Diablo to uh, Pacheco to Oakland along San Pablo Avenue. Uh, he was quite a horseman. Uh, here he's taken up a restaurant. And um, this is uh, <coughs> this is Sheriff Rogers. As you can see here, Martinez Sheriff. This is uh, Ignacio Martinez. By the way, in all the pictures, as an adult, you see him hiding his hand there. Um, he got it blown off, uh, not his hand blown off. He lost three fingers uh, from a shotgun explosion when he was out hunting. The gun was fired and blew off three of his fingers. So. In all of the pictures, you see him hiding his left hand in most of them. Uh, can we go back to that picture, Jeff, just for a second? This is his son, Monte, that he had a, a son also. And at this time, this is 1900, and this is when his daughter, Ramona, is going to be uh, born soon. So he married a woman named Emma. Do you have a picture of her, Jeff? Later on. Later on? You want to show it later? Okay. Anyway, he met her in San Francisco in 1876 when he was over there learning the barbering trade from his brother Antonio. And that's when the Palace Hotel was built, big fancy hotel in 1876. Well, he was over there at that time. He was a horse car driver, horse car driver at that time. Um, he was very much uh, aware of his father, his, grandfa uh, his grandfather's name, um, because he was named after his grandfather and uh, he was very proud of that fact always and during his life. So here he is in Martinez, uh, in his tri restaurant, and he was very good at cozying up to the Americans who were top figures in Martinez. In other words, you know, like the sheriff and uh, other notable figures and so forth. He was also a great cook, and they had these big uh, uh, barbecues that he, would, he and his wife would host. And um, so they got to, to mingle with the people, the Americans, to kind of Americanize themselves a little bit because they were really a second-class group of people at that time. They weren't really accepted into society as they wanted to be, so they had to work their way into society, which they did. Is there any record of what they, kind of food they sold? Or was it a oh, he, I'm sure he sold his empanadas there. He sold those everywhere in Richmond, in the big new city of Richmond, California, too, when he went there to live. Um, had a turbulent marriage, he and his wife were together, divorced, together, divorced, together, divorced. And uh, when he died, they were still separated, but um, they kept in touch with each other. Um, uh, chops, steaks, beans, especially beans, lots of beans and things. But that was the Main Street Cafe. Now here he is in the 1890s, and here's the sheriff again, Loom Rogers, right there. And uh, he's got his barber jacket on. Right? So he's hanging his hand again here. And uh, these are all some of the big shots uh, in Martinez at the time. 
So he cozied up to all these guys to you know, blend in with the uh, environment and the new uh, generations of people. Here he is now, and again, this is the third generation. Um, his concrete barbership in the late 20s. Uh, he died from a heart attack, closed up his shop, went home, sat down, died of a heart attack uh, that night. You know, working as he always did, here as a barber, he died in 1928, the age of 79. I might mention, I forgot to tell you about his father, Vicente Martinez, how he passed away. Vicente Martinez uh, died in 1894. Uh, he was a pathetic figure. Um, he had would been one of the social elites of Contra Costa County and one of the richest men in the county. He died in poverty. And he died, he was, uh, funeral was held in a very horribly stormy, rainy day um, in Martinez. He was buried in the Calvary Cemetery there. But his pallbearers, all six of his pallbearers were people that had taken money from him during his uh, wealthy days. And uh, his obituary said uh, he was an early resident of the area who at one time was very wealthy. <laughs> and that was it, he was dead. But he didn't have anything either. All he had, he never owned land at all. Um, so what he had were a few barber tools and his uh, wife, uh, ex-wife Emma sold them so they could uh, have funeral expenses to bury him, or, which she did. So this is how we look to, the, this is the third generation now that we're talking about here. Okay. Now we get to the fourth generation. This is the girl that my mother grew up with, Ramona Martinez. Um, this is uh, a picture of her uh, when she was three and a half that they had a photographer take. Now she had very nice looking clothes. Her mother, they were very poor. They were the poorest people in Pinot Valley. Even the poorest of the poor in Pinot Valley said they were poorer than they were. But she had a, a dressmaker, a friend in San Francisco, that would uh, get old clothes and make beautiful outfits for Ramona when she was a young girl. Ramona was born in Martinez in 1900. April 20th, 1900, she was born. Uh, her mother, Emma Martinez, uh, delivered her by a, a breech birth. And they had to have a, a doctor deliver her Ramona because it was so difficult for her. I might mention that the lady you saw before, that um, Nieves Soto de Martinez, Vicente's wife, she acted as a midwife for everybody in the area. That's how they made some of their money. She delivered babies. But she couldn't deliver Ramona because of uh, the breach problem, so they had to have a doctor do that. This is Emma Martinez here, as you can see. Um, this is Ramona now. Ramona's about 10 years old at this time. And this is Ignacio hiding his hand again, as you can see here. This was taken about 1910, 1911. Now, Ignacio brought his family to the Pinole Valley in 1907. What happened in 1906? Earthquake. Earthquake. The Great Earthquake. And Bernardo Fernandez owned all of the land at that time in this area. Okay, he had bought it all up. Uh, they used to say that he uh, was a very generous man. If a child uh, opened the gate for him, you would give him a dime or an orange, but if you owed him a penny, he wanted it. <laughs> for sure, okay? But um, anyway, he, he brought his family out here in 1907 to the Martinez Adobe. Fernandez had hired him as a caretaker of the old Adobe. Well, Marti uh, Fernandez had rented the Adobe out to newcomers coming into Pinole. But the adobe was almost completely destroyed by the earthquake. There was only a couple of rooms that were, you know, habitable. Well, Ramona, as you can see here, uh, that's about 1910. She's about 10 years old at that time. Uh, she loved the adobes. She loved the place. Um, it, it's, uh, they lived out there. She, by the way, she was sickly most of her life. And uh, she couldn't eat certain things. and. Um, it was quite unfortunate. But now, she and my mother were good friends. My mother would spend nights in the old adobe, and my mother was scared, she said, because they had uh, blankets separating the rooms, you know, the few rooms that they had. And uh, they had uh, oil lamp, lamps and so forth. It was a scary place. And she said, Ramon and I played dolls, so I guess. <laughs> they went to school together. 
drove uh, in the horse cart together, drove to school together, and they're good, good friends uh, all her life. My mother kept in touch with her. Um, this is Ramona now. <coughs> this is uh, Ramona grown up, 17 or 18. Now, this is when she wrote her most proli prolific amounts of poetry, uh, dwelling on her condition of life because her parents kept breaking up and separating. She and her mother had to go to Richmond together to uh, find rooms to rent out to survive. The father followed them there. They reunited again, broke up again. And she had a very, very tough life. But she loved her mother. Her mother took care of her. And her poetry reflects her love for her mother and the fact that her mother took care of her so well. When Ramona was... Uh, they moved back to Martinez, and again, they rented out rooms, and they lived in one of the rooms, Ramona and her mother, and they rented the other two rooms out in the house. They didn't own the house. They paid the rent for the house. But uh, she got very sick. She worked at Jim's Candy Store for a while uh, in downtown Martinez. Uh, again, the clothes are very, very nice. Her life blossomed in Martinez because she became one of the social elite in Martinez. Her boyfriend was Brewster Swift, whose father was the head of the Mountain Copper Company in Martinez. So she got into the, the upper crest, uh, crest, even though she wasn't suited for it. Um, she had a beautiful, as you can see, she had beautiful blue eyes like her grandfather Vicente Martinez did, a, a beautiful olive complexion. Um, she was called Ramona because uh, her mother, the, the book at that time by uh, Helen Hunt Jackson called Ramona, I don't know if you've heard of it or not, or read it, but that book was very popular, so that's how they got the word Ramona. Her first name was Emily, and the second name, Ramona. And um, <clears throat> um, when she got sick, they thought she had consumption, which is tuberculosis. So that's why they took her out in Pinole Valley, and she was out in, in the valley living at the old adobe. The picture that Jeff showed you before, you want to go back to that one, Jeff? The, this one? Uh, Bernardo Fernandes built this shack for them to live in because the adobe became uninhabitable. It was just falling to pieces and dangerous. So he built this shack for them to live in. Uh, this little boy, Robert, uh, he later on drowned, but uh, he was just busy there. He's not a member of the family. So this is the fourth generation, Ramona Martinez. This is uh, her dad, how he looked at that time. Uh, again, you know, he's a caretaker, a barber, a miner a cowboy, a horse, a stagecoach driver. I mean, he did about everything to bring in money, but they're always poor, okay? And th there was always a lot of family strife. One thing about the Ranchero families, they were like we are today. There was infighting between the siblings. There was fighting between the, you know, the, the girls. I mean, uh, it's interesting when you read about the lore and folklore of the family, you know, that they're, Pretty much like we are today, you know, people get along, sometimes they don't get along, what do they do to compromise? Well, not too often. <laughs> but anyway, this is Ramona, the way she looked when she was healthy. And then she got sick and her girlfriends um, all went all together and took up a collection for her to have surgery. And she had surgery and her stomach and found out she had stomach cancer. And, and there was nothing they could do for her. It wasn't consumption, she had cancer. So at age uh, 18, Ramona lies sick in her bed with her little dog Fatima by her side. Her mother goes out on the streets and brings in anybody to see her, to keep people coming in to see her and try to you know, make her feel better and so forth. And uh, she dies in her mother's arms on December 1st, uh, 1918. And <clears throat> her mother uh, has her uh, buried in Sunset Cemetery in Martin, and pardon me, in uh, El Cerrito. Mm -hmm. And she has Ignacio, her father, um, interred because they, they didn't keep the cemetery very well in Martinez, and he was buried with her here too. So I took this picture at the Sunset Cemetery in Martinez. Ignacio and Martinez, Ignacio and Nicar Martinez, 1849 and 1928, Emily Ramona Martinez, 1918. Uh, I'd like to read you one of the poems that she wrote. I'm almost through. 
Jeff said he's passing out pillows and blankets if I don't finish. <laughs> and ready breakfast even? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Is the um, cemetery still, still there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 very large. Well, no, I'm sorry. Out of Fairmont in Del Cerrito. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sunset, yes. By the way, she's right on the hillside overlooking the Golden Gate. Yeah. It's a beautiful location. I go there every April 20th, her birthday, and take her poppies. It was her favorite flower, was a California poppy, and put on the graveside. Her mom uh, was not buried here. Her mother lived to be in her mid 90s, lived a long time. And she collected anything in the newspapers about the Martinez, and she cut it out. Um, she lived in a trailer court. She got very ill of some family friends from the old Pinole Valley days, uh, took her down to Fremont. And then she passed away, and she's buried down there somewhere. This is a poem Ramona wrote about a time she stayed in the adobes when she was young. It's called The Old Adobe Ranch. I'm just going to read a few of the lines for you. Lonely are those old adobes, gone to ruin of their walls. Yes, I miss those old adobes. Dear to me were all their halls. Though far away from me, it's ruined, shattered walls. The very image I can see in good old times recall. Whether in the winter, summer, spring, or in the fall, there is just one place only that I love the most of all. <laughs> Whether daytime or nighttime, my thoughts will always roam. That spot at the right time, the spot that's home sweet home. But there's just one place I love, and that love is ever true. As the stars are right above it, dear Adobis, and that is you. Isn't, isn't that something to consider? That Don Ignacio Martinez comes out there in 1820, uh, 1837, builds his home, and his grandson of the same name comes and is in the last person to occupy the home as well. And then we have pictures of the adobe as it looked, you know, in his crumbling days also. But this is just one of the poems she wrote as a young girl. She loved the adobe so much. Uh, before, I, before I close, and we see some other pictures of the Martinez adobe as it is today, I want to read to you kind of a summation of the Rancho period of the Martinez family, what happened to them. Uh, this is written by J.F.S. Smith. Now, J.F.S. Smith was a man who created the town of Martinez, divided into lots and blocks. He married Susanna Martinez, and so therefore he was privy to the, the land in Martinez too. Um, he later on committed suicide, she became a widow. <laughs> but anyway, in 1880, <coughs> before he passes away, he wrote this. He said, we took horses and left Martinez, and after a pleasant ride in the midst of a gay cavalcade consisting of some American friends and the gaily dressed retainers of Senor Martinez on fine horses, richly caprisoned with gold and silver mounted trappings, and the Senoras." <coughs> and senoritas of the family Escosan in the peculiar carriage of the country, the carreta, the, the carreta, the big cart. We duly arrived at the ranch of my brother-in-law where we were kindly welcomed by his wife, a leading lady of that once proud <clears throat> and happy family of native aristocracy. The Martinez's and Castro's were among the most refined and wealthy families of the upper district of Contra Costa County. How different in 1880 is the status of the remnants of those once proud and wealthy families with their wide domains and with cattle and horses and immense, <clears throat> in immense numbers covering the hills and valleys. Contact with the Anglo-Saxon race for 32 years has left them mere beggars of their own, at their own threshold. Their domains now the property of strangers. So that, you know, kind of sums up exactly, you know, what people, some of the ob observations of the family and what had happened to the Martinez's. I wish I had more time to go into each of the families, uh, their life stories. That's a whole program in itself for each of these people. But um, you can see how there's interdependency among all the Ranchero families, how uh, their marriages uh, coincided with the neighbors, and uh, how their whole culture was probably to a great deal destroyed by the American, uh, uh, the 
gold rush and the Americans coming to California uh, at that time and uh, taking over the land. And, uh, but they had their heyday from 1822 to 1850. Things were pretty good for them. Now, fast, flash forward to 1975, 1976. Dr. Joe Mariotti has an idea. Joe Mariotti had lots of ideas. Okay, Dr. Mariotti. Uh, you remember the slop crew that uh, <laughs> digging up the old uh, Bernardo Fernandez schooner? That was his idea too. But it was a bicentennial year, okay? 200 years, and he wanted to do something special. So he said, let's dig up five the old adobe. Now Joe, he didn't care about how hard it was to do these things. He just had the idea he was going to do it. And he knew he could do it, and damned if he didn't do it. Okay, well, this is in 1974, or 1975, 1976. I think it started in 1975. Now, this is Priscilla Wiggers. He hired an architect, not architect, pardon me, archaeologist. She was an archaeologist that uh, drew up the plans and uh, did the uh, excavation um, procedures and necessary uh, things that had to be done. Um, this, this is Joe Mariotti here. His leisure suit. <laughs> if, you, if you saw Joe in his later years, he always had his hood on. Yeah. Some, of you, some of you remember he had the hoodie. Yeah. 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 But this is him as a young man. And uh, this is one of the Pereiras, who was a rancher in the deep Panola Valley, <laughs> near Martinez. This is my uncle Vince Scanlon here. Mm -hmm. He was a friend of this guy, Bill Freya. That's uh, Margaret's father, Margaret and Dolores, and uh, Diane's father. And uh, anyway, what are they doing here? Well, somebody had to, first step is, where do you find the adobe? It's all overgrown. Mm -hmm. So that's why he had Bill Freya, my Uncle Vince, uh, the Pereira. They remembered because, um, did we have a picture, Joe, of the adobe as it was, you know, the uh, ruins? I think, I think you had... Uh, yeah. Not on this... Uh, okay. No. But any, anyway, those, those fellows were farmers, and they bulldozed the adobes back into the earth, what was left of it in the 1940s and 1950s. So nobody knew where it was, okay? Um, there is one landmark I'll show you that uh, kind of gives it away. So anyway, all this area, they said, well, it's probably in this area here, those gentlemen, the farmers. So all this area had to be cleared, first of all. That's the very first thing they did, was to clear all this area. By the way, all the workers were volunteers also. Uh, I spent a lot of time out there on my knees digging before I had to have knee surgery and couldn't do it. But uh, uh, lots of kids from the different schools, high schools and so forth, it became a real community project. Joe was very good at getting community involvement, you know, and he knew what he was doing. I mean, uh, Joe didn't give up on anything. If he wanted to go for it, he went for it, and uh, he did it here. <coughs> now, this tree you see here is still there, that eucalyptus tree. That's how you find the adobe. Uh, who planned that? Ignacio Martinez, the man I just showed you a few minutes ago. He planned that in 1900, okay? Mm. Or before 1900. Um, so that tree is very old and still there. Now the creek runs behind it. Now Don Ignacio Martinez, when he first built this home, this adobe home, he also had a vineyard and an orchard. He had 8,000 cattle and 1,000 horses in 19, 1839. It was a huge rancho and uh, a very, very prosperous rancho at that time. Now, where did they get water? They get, needed fresh water. They got it from the creek right behind here. Okay, They needed water. I'm sure they had a well also later on. Um, but if you look here, you see the blossoms there? That's a pear tree. That's one of the original trees of El Rancho Pinole from the 1830s. Pear trees live a long, long time. Uh, Joe took a shoot of the pear tree home with him. He was going to try to grow it in his, uh, at the mansion. I don't know if he ever did or not. Now, if you look here, 
you can see the excavation is started here, and you can see the, the uh, limestone foundation for the adobe here. That's the one. It was, remember, it was 42 feet long by about uh, 18 feet wide at that time. This is, this is a shot of uh, the work, very painstaking work going down inch at a time. You have to you know, square everything, and then each person has a little square, and they have to note what they find in that little square, and uh, sift, 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 sift. It, it was a lot of fun, but it was a lot of work. I mean, uh, a lot of the people started you know, continued through right through 1976, the bicentennial. So this was a big bicentennial project we had. This is one of the uh, things that was found there. This is uh, an Indian um, <clears throat> pestle that they ground their corn or acorns mm -hmm. with in, in a stone called a mortar. Um, and that was found there, one of the few things. By the way, um, just to mention, the Indians, they had Indian servants at in the adobe when the adobe was uh, in the 1830s. Uh, they had, uh, the girls had the Indian servant girls and there were Indian servants uh, all around the rancho. <clears throat> so this is one of the things that was found there. Can you see that picture, Joe? There you go. This, this was taken in around uh, the 1890s and it shows you that's what the original home looked like at that time. Uh, the one that uh, was uh, mortgaged and uh, sold on the courthouse steps for $80.14. Uh, but look at the hills now. Mm -hmm. uh, homes. This, this side of the uh, Plural Valley hillside has not been developed as that side has over there. But this is the old adobe road coming through here. Uh, my mother, when she was teaching school, in the old Plural School in Canal, that she once went to. She used to take her classes out to the Adobe Ranch, what was left of it, for picnics. The kids had great times out there, so forth. But you see the other two Adobes are on either side, they're long gone. They rented those two Adobes out. The old uh, Mrs. Martinez, that was the way, she, well, two ways she got money. She sold her fruit by the stagecoach line, and she also uh, rented out some of her properties. And what happened is some of the squatters didn't want to pay their rent, so she got Samuel Tennant, her son-in-law, Rafaela Martinez's son, uh, pardon me, <coughs> Rafaela Martinez's <coughs> husband uh, that married into the family. He was the enforcer, so he got into gunfights with some of the squatters to get them off the land at that time. But anyway, this is the story of Rancho Panola and the story of the people who lived in it and what happened to them. Uh, time period that was here and gone like the California Grizzly disappeared. What year is that picture from? 1890s. Right before they planted the uh, eucalyptus tree. Yeah, I think, I think he might have planted a little bit, but he, he got there around 1907. So, he, he, but he might have planted it before that time because uh, he lived there from 1849 to 19, 1866. So, it's surprising, but if you want to find out what the adobe used to be, and it's, by the way, we covered it all up again, so you know nobody could dig it up. Um, Joe will tell you there was the next in the excavation. What was found, Joe? Uh, Jeff. 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 Yeah. So, you look like Joe Mirati. Yeah. Oh, uh, right. Sure, I do. Yeah. So um, last year we were contacted by the National Button Bulletin, which is the magazine, the publication of the National Button Association. <laughs> Believe it or not, there is a National Button Association. There are members all over the world. And the reason we were contacted is, you saw a picture of the excavation, Priscilla Weggers, who was uh, an archeologist and an instructor at UC Berkeley, she's still alive and she lives in Idaho. And she had, uh, they took all the remnants of everything they found, and they found 30,000 uh, artifacts when they dug it up. Among them were more than 100 buttons, acrylic buttons, stone buttons, cloth buttons, every kind of material that you can imagine. So we were contacted by the National Button Bulletin uh, to provide some background history 
on the Martinez family and on the Adobe. And we wrote about this in our newsletter last summer. Uh, so you can read that online. And uh, so there's 30,000 artifacts. And supposedly, at some point, those artifacts are coming to the Pinal Historical Society. So again, those of you who have room in your garage, <laughs> yes. you have a spare bedroom, perhaps, that we could use as a storage closet. Please let us know. So question on this picture. Are we looking east or west? I can't get my bearings on this. And I'm wondering what Well, you're kind of looking northeast. We're looking northeast, okay. Yeah. And the and at the four at the lower part of the photo, what is that? Is that the roof? That long that looks like a long plank? Just a moment. Um, George, where's the pointer? I don't want Jeff to get mad. He gave me this pointer. I said last time I had a pointer when I was teaching it was a middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> I have a thing against pointers. <laughs> where, where? Right here? Yeah, right there. Uh -huh. Okay, those, those are those are part of the uh, barns and sheds and uh, uh, you know outhouses, things like that. Okay. In the eighteen nineties, there was uh, Fernandes was still renting out this adobe, and uh, when Jose Martinez got married, the oldest son. They actually built an addition to the adobe to hold all the people that came there. I mean, they stayed there a week, feasting, eating, gambling. They love to gamble, but only after mass. Yeah. But only the church motel. <laughs> <laughs> so we're but looking. Here, here's an okay. outhouse here. If you can see that right there. Uh, and there's the uh, adobe road. That's the adobe, the main road. Uh, yeah. So that's the old valley. That, that what is right there, a valley with no. Houses. That's Pinot Valley. That's Pinot Valley. Oh, okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. How, how far out is it? Like, where's the Y? It's on a where's oh. the Y compared to that? You know where the fire station is? Further than you fire station. Oh, oh, that's about there. Pinot Valley Falls. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got to be. What's the dog? Yeah. Park. Yeah. 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 Was Bruno, was, was Bruno Fernandez? Well, that's where the eucalyptus trees are. Mm -hmm. Was Bruno Fernandez Portuguese? He wasn't California, was he? Bernardo? No, he was. A, he was a Portuguese immigrant. Portuguese. Yeah. So he wasn't California. He was no, no. More no. recent. He was. A, he was a, my family. My but, father's uh, personal doctor. He was he, very. He had house calls. Okay. <laughs> he was so, very, very good at making money and uh, buying land. You know, at that yeah. time. They don't have any questions about it. I'm sorry, you know, if I, yeah. I want to cover too much, and but anyway, I figured. You, know, you refer to the Americans a number of times, so those people would be the people coming from the east at uh, that time. Well, the Yankees, I call them. They called them. The Californians called them the Yankees. Um, they were coming from. They came from the east for the gold cut for gold, but they came from all over the world. There were people from uh, Mexico, mm -hmm. South America, you know, all over. But some of the main players uh, came from the east. Yeah. East coast. Yeah. East coast states. Because a lot of them came by uh, ship by that time too, because San Francisco Bay was um, well. John Charles Fremont uh, in 1846, the the ranchos in Northern California were in a state of shock. That was during the Mexican War, mm -hmm. and Fremont and his American associate, Kit Carson, they were here at. <laughs> Kit Carson murdered two of the California brothers, twins, the De Haro twins. He murdered them in Marin County. And when they heard about that, everybody was panicked in Northern California. General Vallejo would go to the different rancheros trying to conscript people for the fight. But a lot of them hid in the barns or hid away. They didn't want to get involved with the military. But the main fighting in the Mexican War took place in New Mexico and in Southern California. Hey, hey, Fremont uh, and Carson also murdered the Berryessa, Jose de los Reyes Berryessa, along with the Tejaro twins. Correct? Yes. So yes. So it was an elder. So it was an yes. elder and two like teenagers. There twins. were a lot of Berryessas. The Berryessas, they had some, they were kind of scoundrels, some of them too. You know, they, uh, they uh, had their little band of Indians, the Rancherias. They would. Uh, Round them up to uh, use them for slave labor, making building adobe buildings, things like that. But uh, yes, yeah. Anyone so, else have any questions? Yeah, another question. Back to the Indian and Native Americans. Uh, what I'm taking away is that there were so many that even though they didn't have full modern weapons, the by sheer number they were scary. Why did they conduct the raid? Was it a, a revenge thing? Was it a one? Well, they wanted to 
drive, they wanted to, with yeah, they wanted to drive the rancheros out. To get back grants. They had been confined at the missions for a long time, and they were, weren't treated too well there either. Right. But once the missions were secularized, they had no protection anymore. Uh, the, in Mexican America, pardon me, in Mexican California, the uh, ranchos, um, all of the mission lands were divided up and given to rancheros as political favors. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, just to give you an idea, like in this area, in 1838, there was a smallpox epidemic. And it, it helped to quell, quell the Indian problem in this area because it wiped out all of the Susone tribe. Uh, the Susones, uh, you know, um, Chief Solano, that was their chief, Solano County, and uh, Susun was named after the Susunis. They were almost wiped out completely by the smallpox epidemic of 1838. So, uh, but they were they were on the offensive. They were angry. They had their chiefs, and uh, they probably would have pushed the rancheros in, back into the sea. You have to understand that uh, supply was very limited in, in Alta California during the Mexican period. When Martinez was a commandante of the Presidio of San Francisco, they didn't have any powder for the cannons. They, they were just put on there for show to uh, intimidate anybody sailing into the bay. But they were not supplied. Did you ever put this together with like Richard and Henry Dana and his story about right. trading with yeah, 75 years in California, yeah. Richard Henry Dana. Yeah. Or was that two years before the mask? Two years before, two before, years the, before the mask, mask right. Yeah. William Heath Davis wrote 75 years in California, and he talks about the Martinez Rancho in his book. But um, yeah, uh, two years before the mask. That's how people began to know about California. Um, it just yeah. This is good. What, what I find interesting is we always think that James Marshall discovered gold of the Coloma River, and, uh, or James Marshall and, and Wimmer, but it was uh, Francisco Lopez in 1842 in Southern California that first found gold, but he's not that well known. I'm, I'm just no questions from this man. No I'm questions from this man. One thing. This guy did not have that little red pointer in 1961. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't invent this. Did that in <laughs> this is one of my former students when I first started teaching. Okay? Yes. I babysat him for a <laughs> whole year. I carried you during basketball season. <laughs> yes, he did. He was a very good, a good guard, a good shooter. And the best thing about him was his persistence. He wasn't going to give up. There were a lot of guys who were bigger than he was. Everybody was bigger. Yeah. But you, you came around. <coughs> Remember, I let everybody play. <laughs> Remember? I never let anybody just sit the bench. Yeah. Thank you. Just one last thing. Um, you're, also, you're talking a lot about the conflicts of the California Indians and the rancheros, but I think it's also important to mention that there was a little bit more nuance than like they hated the Mexicans or they were always raiding because Mariano Vallejo and Sonoma made an alliance, as you know, with Chief Solano and the Sui Sons to help him against other tribes. Yeah. And also there were land grants granted to native Californians like Rancho Olam Pali, which you can go visit today and walk. So I, I think there's also that to consider. General Vallejo was, was quite the diplomat. You know, he, uh, he was the uh, Americans were going to do away with him. I mean, he was uh, you know, in big trouble when they raided his home in Carolina. But um, he was able yeah, to overcome yeah. a lot of things. Um, he and Martinez, he didn't care for Ignacio Martinez at all. He said he was a despot. <laughs> anyway, enjoy the cookies and uh, we'll come back another time for the second half. <laughs> <laughs>